mine. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2 so we can meditate a bit on this holy convocation that's taking place all around the world at this time around the death of our Savior. We are in Acts chapter 2 considering one of the most monumental events that ever occurred in human history, I would call it the beginning of the New World Order. And I don't say that in a mocking way. What happened 50 days after the death of Christ was the beginning of a new creation. And the book of Acts helps us understand the extent and scope of what took place. And what's unique about Acts chapter 2 again, um, is that there were things that took place that only took place one time. The text before us is a series of first time and one time only events corresponding to the first time and the one time only event by which God is made known to men in saving mercy. And that is the one time and once for all death of Jesus Christ of Nazareth on the cross. He came once, he died once, he rose once and for all to rule and reign as sovereign Lord over everything. Christ rules and reigns as sovereign Lord over everything having assumed a human nature one time. He lived a perfect life one time. He died on Calvary's tree one time. On that cross, he said, it is finished. He rose again, he ascended to heaven, and he seated at the right hand of God. And you don't know it, but the whole world changed the day that Christ took his seat at the right hand of God. On that day, God was pleased to release and loose a whole host of hell-bound sinners and begin the process of bringing them to himself through Jesus Christ by the gospel. And what makes Acts chapter 2 so important for us today, generally on what often people call Good Friday, I call it an awful Friday. I call it an awful Friday. For all sorts of important reasons, the day that Christ was crucified, A.D. 33, on Passover day, was an awful day for both man and the Son of God. For there the whole world was exposed for what it really is by nature. God hating sinners. And on that day, Jesus Christ voluntarily gave up his life so that you and I could escape the damnation of hell. And how do we, after 2,000 years of church history now, appropriately celebrate and commemorate and, and remember the death of Christ on the cross? Do we do it by theatrics and entertainment or some kind of dramatic script where there are stage actors, as it were, repeating the practical, historical, factual events where we're looking at blood and crosses and a man on it? Will that really do for human beings who need a savior? Well, I would submit to you that what we have in Acts chapter 2 is really the pattern of how we ought to all respond to the cross of Jesus Christ, though it occurred some 2,000 years ago. We ought to respond by gathering together, as they did in the upper room. The master told them to tarry and to wait until they be endowed from on high with power from God. And there they prayed. 
and there they waited, and there they worshipped. And in the midst of their worship, something fabulous happened. And it happened one time. One time, God poured out his Holy Spirit upon thousands of people on that day. One time. One time on that day in the upper room, some 120 men and women were endowed with the gift of cloven tongues of fire sitting on their heads, each one of them. One time. On that day, they all spake in utterance, glorifying God in languages that 17 nations having gathered together for Pentecost heard in their own language by a group of Galileans. One time, only one time was the Holy Spirit poured out. Only one time did the sign of the languages in cloven tongues sit on their head, never to be repeated again, never being repeated in the book of Acts, never being repeated in history, never being repeated again, only one time did those 17 nations of proselyte and Jews gather together in Jerusalem and see this event for themselves. They never saw it again, though there were many Pentecosts thereafter, only one time. And only one time did God in his mercy allow his 11 disciples to stand up and explain what it was that took place on that notable day when 17 nations heard in their own language the wonderful works of God. And it's here where Peter now serves for you and me a real lesson as to how we are to honor the Lord Jesus Christ and his death 2,000 years ago. How is it to be done? In worship and in the preaching of the gospel of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. For I submit to you that only in the preaching of Christ will men and women come to a saving knowledge of God. Only in the preaching of that which took place 2,000 years ago will the Spirit of the living God be pleased to grip and grab a heart and bring it to itself. So will you please pray with me now that there might be one person in the room or watching who needs to know God in a saving way. Through that which Peter had preached on that day, we call it the first Christian sermon. It's the first sermon where a man proclaimed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first sermon where God's representative proclaimed the full gospel of the glory of God in Christ, both his coming and his dying and his resurrection and the impact of that resurrection. What a sermon that was. Forty-something verses, Peter speaking, standing forth, which causes me to really think about the grace of God. Isn't God good? Isn't God amazing in his goodness? Isn't the grace of God absolutely stunningly amazing? Let's take for a moment as we make our way into our text. The person that God is allowing now to stand forth and speak in his behalf. His name is Peter. This is what our text tells us in verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice and said unto them, Amazing! Amazing! Out of all the people that met Jesus, lived with him, served with him, Peter? Why Peter? Well, it certainly couldn't have been because Peter was some giant in the faith some great individual who is head and shoulders above the rest of us. I know some of us are looking for Peter at the gate, not me. When I get to glory, I'm not looking for Peter, and it's not because I don't love Peter. I love him. I'm not amazed that Peter is here because he's someone who is far above and beyond anyone in this room, including me, in terms of caliber. I'm amazed because Peter know something about that awful day. For him, it was an awfully burdensome day. It was a bad day for Peter. 
It was a horribly bad day for Peter. It was a day that was so bad, so burdensome, so so overwhelming for Peter that Peter would, that he had just disappeared. Have you ever had a day like that? And yet God in his mercy chooses Peter to be the one to open the door of the gospel to the Gentiles. This is why we call the gospel the grace of God. And it's a grace of God for undeserving sinners. Out of all the people, Peter, notice what it says as we deal with our first point. Peter, the spokesman of that what kind of day? Awful day. Awful day. There are three things I want to call your attention to as we consider Peter under our first point. Three things I want you to consider. Notice that under our first point, we talk about being what? Recovered. Recovered. Do you know when you're saved by the grace of God, you are a recovered sinner? You're a recovered sinner. I, I love using the term, I'm in transition too. You know, we, we use that today with all kind of gender craziness. But do you know believers are in transition? You get to tell folks, I'm in transition too. I'm in transition from being a sinner to being a perfectly holy saint. I'm in transition from leaving this world and going to glory. I'm in transition of being a flawed, fickle, untrustworthy human being to being perfect in Christ. I'm in transition. How about you? And God took a man like Peter, and you know what he did for Peter? He recovered Peter. Peter was devastated when he let the Lord down, wasn't he? And Peter here stands now recovered. And some of us need recovery, don't we? We need real recovery, don't we? And especially when you fall fall like Peter fell. Peter fell miserably. He denied the Lord. He cursed. He swore with an oath. He abandoned the ministry. He was gone and God drawed him back, brought him back, restored Peter and gave him this unique experience that's taking place in verse 14 now. But Peter standing up with the 11 lifted his voice you know when you fall, you don't want to say anything to anybody about anything. But when God recovers you, he gives you grace to get right back on track and open your mouth for the glory of God, doesn't he? Right back on track. That's what the cross does for a redeemed sinner. He's recovered. He's recovered, and he's recovered for this reason. Christ raised him up again. I don't know if you remember, but in Luke's gospel, chapter 22, verse 31 and 32, where Christ has just intimately finished fellowship with the disciples, and he knew they were all jockeying for position, and he said to all of them, Satan has desired to sift you as wheat. That's literally all of them. Satan has desired to sift all of you. In the Greek, you, know the, you would know this is in the plural form. He wants all of you because God, the enemy never wants God's kingdom to advance. His job was to destroy all 12. He got one, didn't he? His job was to destroy all 12. But now notice what it says. He says, Satan had desired to have you that he may sift you as we. And Peter was in the sifting process. But God, but God. Now look at verse 30. Three. Listen to it. But I have what? Pray for you that your faith fails not. And when you are converted, do what? Do what? I submit to you that Peter is obeying that command right now. He's been converted. He's been raised again, as it were, from the dead. He's experienced a resurrection. Because when you fall, you got to get back up again. But you can only get back up by the grace of God. Is that true? Only by the grace of God can you get back up. And here Peter is standing, recovered, and boldly speaking to the audience. I want you to see it. He's not only recovered, but the brother is inspired. Look at verse 14, part B. It says he what? Lifted up his voice and spoke unto them. Now, again, to understand this, you got to go back to verse 4, because verse 4 tells us why it is that Peter is doing this. Listen to the language in verse 4. And they were all what? filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to do what? Speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them what? The word utterance there is our word which means to push a person forward and give them that confidence to open their mouth. What was happening to Peter was the Spirit of God was pressing on him, pushing him, urging him, strengthening. He wasn't doing this in his own strength. 
He was doing this under the unction of the Spirit of God. And if you ever have had that blessed experience where the Spirit of God is moving you, there is no human effort involved. Your mouth opens up and it pours out. Now, mind you, there must be something on the inside for it to come out. Let's not get crazy now. Peter grew up under the Word of God. He grew up under Torah. He grew up under the Tanakh. He was taught from a child, so the Word of God was in him. All he needed was the anointing. And the anointing pushes him forward several times in the book of Acts. And what you see here is critically important for you to know. Because one of the chief works of the third person that was sent by Christ because of his death was in order to empower the church to share the gospel with a hostile world. In order to empower the church to share the gospel with a hostile world. The audience before Peter is hostile. Fifty days earlier, a little servant girl ran him out of town. Today, he's standing in front of thousands and speaking forth. What's that? Inspiration. The inspiration of the Spirit of God working in the life of Peter. And, and Peter is setting forth, according to the text, a clear message to these people. Now, you and I know he had a mouth. He had a mouth, and his mouth got him into trouble a lot of times. But do you know God can fix your mouth? When he fixes your heart, he fixes your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, that the mouth what? And while Peter's mouth got him in trouble, now it's being used for the glory of God. And Peter will open his mouth now and share some things with all of us that are worthy of marking. So not only is he recovered, he's also inspired but he's also doing what we need to know now is explaining and expounding. Explaining and expounding what? This fantastic mystery, this miracle, this phenomena that had taken place that the people didn't understand. Look with me again at verse 15. Notice what he says. For those, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but what? the third hour of the day. You may be very familiar with the language. It's early in the morning. The disciples have been tearing. They have received the Spirit of God. They have been qualified to declare the gospel. The noise has shed abroad all the way down to Jerusalem. The people have come out by the thousands and thousands, but they don't understand what's going on. And Peter has the privilege of explaining to them, this is that which took place. Now, what's very insightful is how the Spirit of God has given Peter the kind of clarity and unction as he speaks forth to tell them specifically what's going on. Now, notice what it says in verses 15 through 17. These are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Here it is. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaids will I pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And then he says these words in the next three verses. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the lord come now watch this watch this and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be what saved now ladies and gentlemen what just happened there is of significant note peter has just reached back into the old testament he's reached back into the scriptures Peter's whole message from verse 14 to verse 22 and then from verse 22 to verse 37 is what we call a scripture-saturated sermon. A scripture-saturated sermon. In a lot of our churches, you get a pastor or a preacher who quote one verse and then for the next 30 minutes, they're on to something who knows what. But biblical apostolic preaching starts with the Word of God, stays with the Word of God, and ends with the Word of God. And biblical apostolic preaching preaches Christ through the Word of God. 
Now, I call your attention to the two witnesses that Peter is calling upon to explain what he's dealing with. One is the minor prophet Joel in Joel chapter 2. The other one that we will deal with on Sunday is King David. He pulls these two prophets and their text, their document, their inspired document to argue his point that what these men are experiencing was declared in the word of God. And what I want you to see before you in our present text is two very crucial things in verses 17 through 21. In verses 19 and 20, you see this looming judgment of God's wrath pictured by the sun being turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day. Do you guys see that? That's a symbol and a motif. It is Old Testament language about the wrath and judgment of God. When you read your Bible, God often talks about shutting the sun down or darkening the sun and, and turning the moon into blood and the stars falling from heaven. Whenever a nation has rebelled against God, disobeyed God's word, he warns them that the nation that forgets God will be turned into hell. And what Peter is doing here is reminding these Jews that right now at the moment is the day of salvation, but they have only so long to respond according to what they're hearing before these looming judgments fall on them. You see, according to Joel chapter 2, Joel is writing at a time when God is bringing the Babylonians upon Israel because of their sustained rebellion for hundreds of years. And if you read Joel chapter 2 carefully, in fact, I want you to turn there. I want to show you something in Joel chapter 2. I'm going to read a few verses there to help you see the tenor and tone of what Peter is setting forth so that you can appreciate why he reaches back. In Joel chapter 2, I'm going to start at verse 12 and work my way through verse 19, just giving you a flavor of what Peter is doing. Because what you have in Acts chapter 2 is a dual prophecy being set forth, one in the past and one in the future. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, that's the way our Bibles are set up for us. When you read the Bible, you read history. But that history is also prophecy which means many of the things that happened in the past can also happen to us if we don't respond to the word of God in an ethical way in terms of where we are, our condition before God and God's mandate upon us. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Now, I want you to hear this language and notice and think for yourself for a moment how these Jews, these Hebrews in Acts chapter 2 must have considered Peter's bold proclamation of Joel's prophecy. They knew it well. Here it is. Verse, verse 11. And the Lord shall utter his voice before his army, for his camp is very great, for he is strong that executes his word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can abide it? Saints, do y'all know that God has a day wherein he will judge this world in righteousness? Do y'all know that? Do you know that the Bible frequently talks about the day of the Lord? Now, if nobody on planet Earth ought to know and believe in the day of the Lord, it ought to be believers. There is what we call the day of salvation. When the gospel comes in power and saves you and reveals Christ to you, isn't that a wonderful day? But before that day, you know what day God has to show you? The day of judgment the day of God's holy justice against humanity's rebellion against him. He has warned the world from the beginning of time that there is a day in which he will judge the world. It's called the day of the Lord. Israel was well acquainted with it. Listen to the language. Verse 12. Therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye, even turn to me with all your what? And with what? fasting and weeping and mourning. Stop! Do you see what God is saying to Israel? He's saying, you're in trouble. Return to me. But when you return, return right. He's calling them to repentance. And he's calling them to repentance from the depths of their soul. When was the last time you repented of your sin? with weeping and fasting and lamentation. 
seriously and earnestly wanting God to, God to pardon you and cleanse your soul? Or do you walk around presumptuously believing that God has already forgiven you? For if the latter is true, your hearts are hard. And you don't yet know the grace of God in conversion and turning. That's what happened to Peter. Peter was turned. And you and I have to be turned. And the language that he's using here is helping us understand how serious God is about his people turning away from their evil. You know, we'll go to God and we'll confess, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me for this, that, the other thing. But do you know it takes a real work of the Spirit of God to break your heart? It takes a real work of the Spirit of God to put you in your own little closet where you call out to God with tears and a broken heart. A broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. But that's the kind of heart that God has to bring to himself that's really ready for mercy. Really ready for mercy. Listen to the language as it goes on. He says in verse uh, uh, 13, rend your heart and not your garments. In other words, don't play church. Turn unto the Lord your God, for he is what? And he's what? And slow to anger and of great kindness, and he repents him of the evil. Is that the God we serve? Is our God gracious? Is he slow to anger? But he will punish sin. And see, those, that's the kind of God we know according to the Bible. And, and we ought never to play games with God because every day you linger in repentance. Your heart gets harder and harder and harder. And even a holy day like today doesn't move you. Even a day where we are looking square in the face of the sacrifice of Christ hanging on the cross doesn't move you. Even today, when we are contemplating the crucified Christ, the heart is not moved. Ought it not be moved? Especially when you think about who it is that hung on that cross. Why he hung there. What he endured. And here's the final one. For whom he endured it. If you say you are a child of God, doth not the cross move you? Look unto me. Look unto me. Is there any who has experienced the sorrow that I have experienced, says the lamentator? No man has endured what Christ has endured. You look upon that cross, it ought to bring you down. It ought to cause you to think through once again. Where do I stand with God? Here it is. He says, he is slow to anger and of great kindness, and he repents him of the evil. Who knows if he will return and do what? Repent and leave a blessing behind. That's what I want. I want a blessing. I want the blessing that comes from him giving me grace to acknowledge my sin before him, to turn from my evil ways if I have departed from the Lord. Don't you? That's what the cross work is all about. May the Spirit of God begin that work in somebody's heart today. Lest you leave from this holy convocation unaffected by looking square in the face of the only mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. Listen to the language. Verse 15, God's serious. He says, blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly. Do you see what he's saying? The whole nation, y'all blow the trumpet in every city all through Israel. Let everybody know God is calling you to repentance. God's calling you to turn from your evil way. The day is still the day of mercy. Bow down, cry out fast, turn to the Lord your God. Oh, that that might happen to our nation. Our nation is in trouble. Our nation is in trouble. It mocks God. It mocks his word. It mocks his son. It mocks everything that's holy. And we are contaminated by it as well. Oh, my God, grant repentance to America. And to his churches first. For his churches are hypocritical, playing games with God. And not being real with the true and the living God. God have mercy on us. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, 
assemble the elders and the children and those that suck at the breast. Let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride out of her closet. In other words, stop rejoicing for a moment and fall on your face and call upon God as a unified front. High and low, rich and poor, old and young, turn to God. If that ever happens, God has granted repentance unto life. If that ever happens, the Spirit of God has begun to move in the hearts of men and women. This is why in your lifetime, you've never seen it happen. You've never seen the nation turn. None of us have ever seen our nation turn. Because the only way you turn is if God turns you, breaks your heart, brings you low, and causes all of us to take our sins seriously. He's calling the nation. See, here's what God is doing, whether you know it or not. He's teaching them how to get right with God. He's not making them do it. He's teaching them what to do. Listen to the language as it goes on. Verse 17, let the priests and the ministers of the Lord weep between the porch and the altar and let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and give not your heritage to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the heathen, where is their God? You see what's happening now? The ministers ought to be on their face calling out to God to spare the people from God's judgment. Fathers ought to be on their face calling out to God for their children. Mothers ought to be on their face calling out to God for their children. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? This is the condition that Israel is in. And this is the call that God is yielding to Israel. And, and God is saying, if there is this kind of response, let me show you the blessing. Now we're going to hear Peter's words repeated. Now notice what it says here. He says here in verse 19, Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen. Do you see that? Verse 28, here it is. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon your servants and upon your handmaids in the days, in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Here it is. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and pillar of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord shall come. And here it is. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Yes. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance as the Lord has said and in the remnant when the, whom the Lord shall what? Call. Go back to Acts chapter 2 now with me. You have a historical context. And the historical context is ominous, isn't it? It's not some flippant, light, juvio kind of jolly thing that Peter is talking about, is he? Peter is taking that historic event of which God was warning Israel about judgment and bringing it to Israel in his own day and letting them know the thing that you are experiencing right now, the outpouring of the Spirit and the languages of these folks the thing that you are experiencing now is a probational period of God's presence of which if you don't turn from your sin, you will miss this blessing. That's what he's saying. In fact, listen to how this works itself out in Acts chapter 2. <clears throat> the way Peter structures it is actually in the reverse. He talks about the blessings of the Spirit of God being poured upon the servants and, and what you and I know is the major featured gift of the ministry and that's the proclamation of the word. And then he says, I will show you signs in the heavens and, and wonders and, 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 and on the earth beneath in blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Ladies and gentlemen, do you know from the days of the Lord Jesus' incarnation that all these things occurred? Stay with me now. At the time of Christ's incarnation, God was doing signs and wonders in the heavens, wasn't he? Angel visitations and manifestations of the power of God. Was that not the case? Was God doing signs and wonders in the days of Jesus Christ? 
Yes, he was. He was raising the dead and he was healing the sick and he was manifesting his presence through Christ. He was calming the storms. He was speaking from heaven. And even on that awful day when our Lord was crucified, he shut the lights out on the sun. He caused an earthquake to take place at that very same time. And the graves opened up and many came out of the graves, did they not? All during the life of Messiah, these signs and wonders were taking place to let Israel know that God was present. All these signs were taking place. Peter is building upon this to deal with his audience because he knows that his audience, while he's guided by the Spirit of God, has to reckon with what they just did to the Son of God 50 days earlier. Point number two. Point number two. The Lord Jesus Christ, through Peter, speaks to his murderers. The Lord Jesus Christ, through Peter, speaks to his murderers. Will you look at verse 22? You men of Israel, hear these words. Is Peter bold or what? Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by what? Miracles and wonders and signs. Is that not my point? Miracles and wonders and signs and signs and miracles and wonders. And in fact, no one did the number of miracles that Jesus did or the kind of miracles that Christ did to let Israel know for sure that they were living in the days of the Messiah. A man approved among you. So what Peter is doing right now is indicting them with the fact that they knew who he was. So under our second point, I have four yous. You, that's what Peter says in verse 22. You men of Israel, you men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of what? You. Watch this. And you yourselves know. What do they know? They know four things. They know that all through the ministry of Jesus, they rejected him. A full frontal rejection of Christ. Four yous in your outline. The first is, we will not have this man to rule over us. All through our Lord's ministry, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees oppose his teaching, oppose his authority, oppose his word, oppose his reason, oppose his wisdom, oppose the evidence of who he was as he claimed to be the son of the living God. Did they not oppose him? John chapter 19 makes it very plain in verse 15. We have no king but Caesar. We have no king but Caesar. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto him, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, what? We have no king but Caesar. See, but we have to make a little application as we move to our next point, don't we? On a 24-hour-a-day cycle, do you find yourself rejecting the lordship of Christ for King Caesar on this earth? You see the problem? You see the challenge? Where the will of God is so vividly in front of you, your own will takes over. I have no king but Caesar. Money rules. Fame rules. My own glory rules. And the whole nation rejected him. That's the first you. The second you is, this man that we who are believers in Christ and we call him precious, is he precious to you? Jesus is the precious stone of God. And the Bible tells me he's holy, he's harmless, he's undefiled, he's separate from sinners. The Bible tells me he's the only one that did no sin, knew no sin. And in him was no sin at all. Now, I know you and I are all nothing but sinners. And the whole world together. I don't even have to live with you, and I know you're a sinner. There was one man who walked this earth for 30-something odd years, never ever sinned once. Holy, 
harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, knew no sin, did no sin, in him was no sin at all. He was so confident about his sinless and righteous and holy state, he said, which one of you can convince me of sin? Now, you got to be confident, isn't that right? Because if you just walk with me, you'll find my sin. Just walk. You ain't got to let, look, it'll just come out. Christ, the Son of God, was impeccably righteous. He is the righteous one, the only righteous man that lived. And guess what they did? They called him a child of fornication, a wine bibber and a glutton. They called him a devil and a Samaritan, a leader of a sect, a ringleader of a sect. They called him every derogatory name under the sun. And there was no fault in him at all. These are the people to whom Peter is talking. They first said, he will not rule over us and give me every curse word you can name. I'll put it on Jesus. The third you that Peter is laying on them is the you of his constant being harassed by them to kill him. Do you know from the moment that Christ was conceived in the womb, the enemy was trying to kill him? We learn this in Revelation chapter 12, right? We see a sign in heaven, a woman with child, right? The moon under her feet, the stars on her head, and she's encompassed by the sun. And we know that she is great with child. And the devil, that old serpent and dragon called the devil, is seeking to destroy the man child as soon as he be what? Born. And so Jesus immediately upon birth had to leave home and go to Egypt, didn't he? And then when he came back, God had to shroud his life in such a way that from his birth to about 12 years old, we know nothing about him, do we? And then upon his baptism in Matthew's gospel, chapter 3, immediately he's driven into the wilderness and what? Tempted of the devil. And the moment that he's done with that temptation, here comes the rulers of the church. And they harassed him all the way to the point of plotting to kill him. Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came. Ruin sinners to reclaim? You better say hallelujah. What a Savior. What a Savior. Go with me in your Bible to John's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 53, and mark this plotted scheme on the part of the rulers to take our Lord out. In John chapter 11, just one verse for you to mark our point so that you might get it. In John's Gospel, chapter 11, here's what it says, and I'm going to come back here before our time is out tonight. Verse 53, are you there? It says, Then from that day forth they took counsel together for to do what? Put him to death. You read the Gospel of John, chapter 5 through 8. Christ is constantly wrestling with them over the fact that he is not bearing record of himself, but his father is bearing record through him so that his record is true because out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be what? Established. And he was affirming his testimony that he was sent by the father and that he was the son of God by the miracles that he did, by the words that he said, by the life that he lived. And they were constantly calling him a liar. And he told them in John chapter eight, you are of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning, and he never abode in the truth, and you are just like him. And he affirmed it by saying, because I am a man who has told you the truth, and you are seeking to kill me. And that's when they said, now we know you have a devil. Who's going about to kill you? You see how liars continue to lie? John chapter 8 is only about a half a year before they actually finish this deadly plot. So we've done, dealt with three very emphatic and direct indictments by Peter against these Jewish rulers. We will not have him to rule over us. He's called everything under the sun. They plotted his demise. And if that was not bad enough, as he is on the road, that Via Dolorosa that we just heard sung so eloquently to Calvary, the whole nation tells Pilate, his blood be upon us and our children. 
We will not have him. Listen to it in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verse 25. I want you to see again on this awful day what has occurred. And then let's quickly make application as we move to our last and final point for tonight. Matthew chapter 27, verse 50, verse 25. Are you there? Listen. When, verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying what? I am innocent of the blood of this what? Just person. See to it yourself. Then answered all the people and said, His blood be on us and our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Do you see how demonic they were? Controlled they were by evil to destroy Christ. Now here's the simple metaphor that Christ used. Men love darkness rather than light. They will not come to the light that their deeds might be manifest, that they're wrought in God. And when Christ came, he came as the light of the world. This is why today our world cannot tolerate the Bible or the Christ of the Bible. It can tolerate a distorted and perverted and twisted Jesus, but not the Jesus of the Scriptures. Because the Jesus of the scriptures is the blistering light of the world. So bright is Christ that nothing is hid from him with whom we have to do. And that makes all of us uncomfortable when we love our sin. Give me a Jesus who doesn't lift the rug, open the door, or the cabinets. Give me a Jesus that gives me enough room to walk in darkness. And let me go to heaven still. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? That's the Jesus this religious generation loves. And that's the Jesus of our church today. We do not preach the Jesus of the word of God. We are not preaching the Christ of scripture today. For if we were, men and women couldn't tolerate it. They couldn't tolerate this Jesus. He was only in the world for three and a half years. Tens of thousands flocked because of the heat and ran because of the light and left them with only 120 in the upper room. Will you go away also? Because there's a day coming when the light will shine on you so blisteringly clear that you'll have to ask yourself, am I his or am I not? Am I trusting in my own works? Am I hiding behind the fig leaves of my own religion? Am I confident in my own stature, in my own wisdom, in my own accomplishments? Or am I really standing on the solid rock of Jesus Christ and him crucified? See, only when you know that you know that you are his can you allow him to cut the lights on fully and expose you for everything that you are. Isn't that what David said? Search me and try me and know if there be any evil way in me and remove it far from me, Lord Jesus. As David was serious about glory. One thing have I desired, that will I seek after, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You're headed to glory, you got to walk in the light. You're headed to glory, you got to walk in the light because the path of the just is a shining light that shines more and more, not less and less, more and more unto the perfect day. Not less and less. There's no darkness or shadow of turning with God. And then we plainly see it in our text. And finally, I want to move to my last point. Our final and third point, just to meditate on the message that Peter preached. And we are only really dealing with the opening presentation of Peter. And I needed to act, actually help you get a grip on the weightiness and solemnness of his message. We're so shallow as Christians in this generation. We don't think deeply. We don't contemplate long enough. And we're not serious in our walk with God. And as a consequence, the word of God does not bring the clarity that it could if we were walking with God in the kind of communion we should. Peter is standing here with a spirit-filled boldness, 
taking his time systematically exposing Israel of a horrible criminal crime of which if he didn't have the Spirit of God, he wouldn't be able to do this. And the Spirit of God is pressing upon them the indictment that they are guilty of killing the Son of God. One more verse. Look at verse 22. This is where I want to begin to close our thoughts around the crucifixion of our blessed and glorious Savior. It's going to be verse 22 and verse 23. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, hear these words, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. That last of the word there, know, means know and understand clearly. They know and understand clearly. Verse 23, here it is. Him. Do you see it? Him. Do you see it? Him. That's the name of our Bible, isn't it? Him. Don't we call our Bible the Him book? It's all about Him. As the Father opened the heavens in Matthew 17, 5, and said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. As Jesus said in John 5, 39, You are searching the Scriptures, and in them you think you have eternal life, but they testify of Him. And the psalmist plainly said it, Lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written about who? Him. And Revelation 19, 10 says, the spirit of Christ, or the testimony of Jesus Christ, is the spirit of prophecy. This Bible is about who? H I M. H I M. So Peter has brought us to the center and heart of revelation. He has brought us to God's mouth being wide open and God uttering one unanimous revelation about himself, which is only found in Christ. It's the Him factor. And finally, let's deal with this hymn. The hymn that you must know if you're going to be saved. The hymn that you must know if you're going to be redeemed. The hymn that you must know. There are three things in this text that I want to pull out to underscore who this hymn is. This hymn is one, according to Peter, who was delivered up by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. Do you see that? We know that Peter was endowed with the Spirit of God because fishermen don't talk this intelligently. <laughs> Him, God delivered up paradidomai by a predetermined counsel and foreknowledge. We only do three syllables in government school, don't we? And yet Peter now is unfurling for us a magnitude of rich redemptive truth that you got to get. And the first one is this. Christ was chosen of God in eternity past. Christ was not a plan B, he was plan A. In fact, there is no plan B. And before anything was created, anything was brought into being, anything was purpose, God had positioned Christ to be the chosen one. In fact, what we say about this chosen one, we say according to Revelation 13 verse 8, he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Did you guys get that? The Bible tells us that Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If you pause on that for a moment, here's what you understand. God saw a problem before it happened. And he fixed that problem before it occurred. So that sinners who become saved are saved on purpose, not by accident. They are saved by God's predetermined counsel and foreknowledge. But they're saved in Christ, not themselves. God chose Christ to be the means of redeeming hell-bound sinners. And this is also amazing. Christ said yes to the Father before they created anything. He said yes to be the Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb. We almost sung the hymn. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this that God would choose me before I even had a being, 
and fix my problem before I created that problem and do it by taking all my responsibility and placing it on his son. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, that God would secure my eternity with him and his son before he created anything. In other words, he fixed my problem before he created the world. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. What wondrous love is this? What wondrous love is this? He chose him in eternity. This is what Micah the prophet says in Micah's uh, prophecy, Micah chapter 5, verse 4. Pull it up briefly, if you will. I want the folks to see it. Listen to what it says. And he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Watch this. And they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. Back up to verse 2. Back up to verse 2. Here it is. But thou, Bethlehem Ephrata, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth unto me, that is to be the ruler in Israel. Who is this? Jesus, whose goings forth have been from old, what? Even from everlasting. God's counsel starts with himself before he created anything. God's never trying to figure out anything. Y'all know that? The God of the Bible has never, ever asked a question as if he doesn't know. The only reason he would ask a question is in order to have a conversation with you. And when he asks that question, he wants you to already know that you don't have the answer. He does. Because your thoughts are not God's thoughts, nor are your ways his ways. He only asks questions because he loves having fellowship with you. But it's not because God is ignorant. And God did not sweat when Adam and Eve fell. Do you understand what I'm saying? And God will not sweat on judgment day. When a whole host of unnumbered sinners perish under the wrath of God for rejecting his darling son. For Christ has been held out to sinners from the beginning of time. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. He's been held out this way from the beginning of time. He's still held out today, is he not? He's held out as the only way, only truth, and only life. God chose him. God chose him. And guess what? He was committed to God's counsel and purpose. Isn't this the thing that we heard repeatedly in the Gospels? I came to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. I must be about my father's business. Isn't that what it says? And then in John chapter 17, verse 4, you know what he says? Father, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. Only man in this world that ever finished anything. Only man in this world that ever finished anything. Only man in this world that ever finished anything. See, you and I don't just finish stuff. We stop stuff. We halt on stuff. But we never finish anything. You understand? Just when we say it's finished, it messes up and we got to go back again. When a thing is finished, you don't have to ever mess with it again. And when Christ died on Calvary's tree, do you hear me? It was finished. It was finished. Not only was he chosen of God in eternity past, not only was he committed to God's counsel and purpose as the word of God is so replete to say, but he was the one, and this is where we will close, that was chosen to be condemned as the sacrifice for his people. Show you two phenomenal passages. Go back to John's gospel, chapter 11, verse 49 through 52. Now, as we look at this passage, I want to warn you. I want to warn you about religion. I want to warn you about the fact that you can know so much about God and still go to hell. I, I want to warn you. I want to show you something. I want to show you how you can study your Bible and become familiar with your Bible prophetically, expositorily, ex exegetically, you can learn doctrine, systematic theology. You can be orthodox in your fundamentals of the faith. Listen to me. And you can be a teacher. You can be a ruler in Israel, a ruler in the church. You can actually know what the Bible teaches about glorious doctrines like substitution. And know that the Bible teaches that the only way you and I get into God's glory is because of a substitute. That without a substitute, without this doctrine of somebody taking your place, you can't get into heaven. 
You can know this, teach this, defend this, and still go to hell. Watch this. In verse 49 of chapter 11, here it is. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, you know nothing. They're all struggling with what to do with Jesus. Nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should what? One man should what? Now watch this. Here's the doctrine of substitution for the people. The rulers knew the doctrine of substitution. Do you see it? Now watch this. And Caiaphas said, this is expedient. This is not even an option. In a demonically devil-inspired heart, he takes the light of Scripture and uses it as the most dark, demonic, hellish tool against the Son of God any person could. He uses the very doctrine of Scripture necessary to save us to reject Christ. Do you see it? Now watch this now. Here it is. Here it is. Verse 50, 50, uh, 51. And this spake he not of himself, but being the high priest that year, he what? That Jesus should die for the nation. When you pause and consider this verse, you have to consider an aspect of the sovereignty of God that really should humble you. Because there is an aspect of God's sovereignty in dealing with human beings by which he will allow you to have so much knowledge that you can interpret deep things of Scripture and still be a child of the devil. The devil knows doctrine better than most of us. And Caiaphas is wholly given over to Satan. And yet he understands these rich, necessary, redemptive truths. Which I'll show you in a moment why. And yet he's solving a dilemma. In the conscience of the people today, at that time, they're all struggling with killing an innocent man. You got that? They're struggling with killing an innocent man. Because all the trumped up charges that have been raised against him, alleged against him, are not sticking in the conscience of these people. They don't really want to do it. But hell is pushing its way through, is it not? According to the predetermined counsel and foreknowledge of God. Got it? Hell is pushing and God is pushing. Hell is pushing, and God is pushing. Hell is pushing, and we can see it. God is pushing, and we can't. We simply know it. Peter just explained it. The predetermined counsel. And no one can thwart God's counsel, can they? See, all the rulers are doing God's will. Pilate wants to let him go. Let him go. Let him go. I find no fault in this man three times, right? Nope. He has to die. Hell has to have its way today. But God's going to have his way too. You see what's in our text, even according to Peter, is the clashing of two wills. The will of man and the will of God. You guys got that? The clashing of two wills. You know, some of our folks are deluded in believing that they have a free will. No, you don't. Your will is bound by sin. My will is bound by sin. All we can ever do is sin until God liberates us from a fallen nature, until he liberates us from a fallen nature, we will only utilize our volition to get our way. And what you see right here is the will of man wanting to kill the son of the living God. You also see the will of God wanting them to do it. Do you see it? Wanting them to do it. Wanting them to do it. Listen to the language. He says... And this he spoke not of himself, being a high priest in that year. He, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation, and not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together, what? One, the children of God, scattered abroad. Now look at verse 53. We were here a moment ago. From that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Do you see the passages coming together now? 
They're coming together to fulfill the will of God, but in fulfilling the will of God, they're fulfilling their own demonic will too, aren't they? The will of man and the will of God. Go back to our text to close it down. The will of man, the will of God. Jesus Christ is condemned at the sacrifice of his people, is he not? And how is it that these Jews are so very clear on this? There's one more verse in your head before I read Mark's gospel, chapter 15, verse 33 through 39, just to give you the historical context for the death of Christ. How is it that the Jews are so vividly aware of the necessity of a substitute dying for their sin? In the morning, a lamb is slain. At noon, a lamb is slain. In the evening, a lamb is slain every day. This went back 1,500 years to Exodus chapter 12, where on the first Passover, God told the whole nation in the book of Exodus, remember, that you are to take a lamb on the first day of Nisan, Abib in the uh, Old Testament, which is around April, May. This is why we always observe the resurrection during April. And for 14 days, you fat that lamb up. You feed him, you love him, you nurture him for two whole weeks, 14 days. And on the 14th day, guess what you are to do? Slaughter the lamb. Now imagine this, every household in Israel shedding the blood of a lamb so that the blood is poured out. And guess what they were supposed to do? Take the blood and put it over the doorposts of every house. You guys got that? And you remember the promise of God? And when I see the blood... I will pass over you and not bring upon you the plagues that I will bring upon the children of Israel. Listen to, listen to the conflict. Listen to the conflict. The conflict is this. You and I have to put our hands on an innocent lamb and kill it in order for God not to kill us. Did you get it? You and I have to take the innocent lamb and slaughter it and deal with all of the emotional component that goes along with that animal that we know and loved and nurtured for 14 days so that God could bring you into something of a knowledge of the preciousness of his son that he had to offer up for your own sin. Are you guys with me so far? In order to bring you into the reality that Christ's death is not only to be understood as precious to us, but precious to the Father. You got it? It's the Father's lamb that he gives for the sin of the world. It's the Father's lamb, which he had for many more than 14 days from eternity, from eternity from eternity. This is what makes Calvary so absolutely astonishing. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Does that move you? It ought to. One last text and we're done. Go with me in your Bible to Mark's gospel. Chapter 15. Verse 33 through 39. As a rule, what we generally do in the Christian church is take a portion of Scripture out of Matthew's Gospel, Mark's Gospel, John's Gospel, concerning the historical account of Jesus. And then we just kind of revisit that text. What I wanted you to experience today and what I want you to experience on Sunday is that what God really designs for us to do is what Peter is doing on Pentecost and that is preaching Christ and what it means for him to have died, not to simply revisit the history. And here's the reason why. He's not going to assume a human nature again. 
He's not going to live a perfect life again. He's not going to die on Calvary's cross again. He's not going to be buried again. He's not going to rise again. He's not going to ascend into heaven again. He's not going to pour out the Holy Ghost again. He has done that. And what God would have you and I to do is preach the finished work of Jesus Christ so that the Spirit of God can actually save somebody by the living Lord, not just the past historical facts. Are you guys hearing what I'm saying? But for our heart's good, I'll close with these words. Then we'll take up our text on Sunday. Matthew 15, verse 33. Uh, uh, Mark's gospel, rather, 15, 33. And when the sixth hour was come, that's noontime, there was darkness all over the whole land until the ninth hour. See the sign and wonder? God did that. The archaeological and astrological, uh, astronomical records have an eclipse on that day at that time. It's recorded. God closed the curtains when he took his son to task for our sin. You guys got that? He closed the curtains on the Holy Son of God. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And if you're a believer, you know the answer. Don't you? If you're a believer, you know the answer. Don't you? And if you're not a believer, you may know the answer, but you don't benefit from it. Listen to the language. And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, Let alone. Let us see whether Elias will come to take him down. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, and he gave up the ghost. What a cry that must have been. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And when the centurion, which stood over against Christ, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he had a revelation. This is why we know that this had to be a special cry. A cry like no other human beings cry. There were many people crucified that day. Many malefactors and criminals crying out from the torture, excruciating pain. But there was no cry like the cry of the Son of God. His cry was the cry of his substitution and suffering under the wrath of God at a level that you and I could never describe. The weight of all of the sins of all of his people were laid on him. For God laid on him the iniquity of us all. The iniquity of us all. It pleased the Lord to bruise him, to put his soul to grief, that he might make his soul an offering for sin. What an awful day. What an awful day. What an awful day awful day pointing to the ultimate awful day this is why we say the cross is a day of judgment enter into that judgment now and you'll find life if you reject that day there's another day coming 
Only in that day, there will be no lamb. There will be no sacrifice. There will be no substitute. There will be no surety. There will be no representative. There will be no one to stand in your gap. It will just be you all by yourself bearing your own sin. Put your eyes back on Christ and let your soul be admonished and let your soul be instructed even before you close your eyes tonight. If you are without Christ, if you don't know him in the pardon of your sins, in the forgiveness that comes freely by his grace, if you're just plain church, if you've been to this event for 30 to 40 to 50 times, just for this moment, let your heart be true to God and Christ and say just between you and God, I need him. I need Christ. I need that man that died on the cross 2,000 years ago. I need him. I need a savior from my sins. I need a redeemer. I need someone who can pay for my sins. I can't do it. I need him. I need your son. Say it. And God have mercy on you.